can anyone help uh, with uh, minutes? Uh, I'm going to be taking notes myself, but uh, it'll be best if uh, we have a backup to take whatever uh, notes I could I could miss. Hi Juan, um, I could help, but uh, I also have a presentation. Um, that part. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Okay, you're welcome. And, uh, thank you. And uh, well, it's the hour now, so um, I guess we can get uh, started. Ha. Huh. Hi, was him. Welcome. Great. So, welcome everyone to ITF 110 Interior Working Group. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Zuniga and Wasim Haddad. Uh, second, let me play here with the screens. So, um, the virtual meeting tips and etiquette. Please join the queue, raise your hand before participating so that we can handle the, the queue and make sure that your mic is muted unless you are speaking. Ideally, we want to turn off uh, video to save bandwidth. And uh, below you have the, the details about the meetings and, uh, and Mythical. Uh, for the note well, uh, this is an official meeting. You, you're probably familiar by now, but uh, by participating in this meeting, you agree to follow the IETF process and policies. So please, if you're aware of any contribution that it's covered or related to a patent or patent application, uh, please disclose it uh, either uh, to the list uh, or to the chairs. Uh, also, for your information, uh, this meeting will be will be recorded, and your attendance will be registered. So, um, minutes are are being taken. Uh, your presence again is locked. Uh, for the scribes, uh, I actually have the, the wrong links there, but uh, it'll be best if we can contribute the, the online minutes to the to the Kodi MT directly. Um, as a reminder, these uh, minutes uh, are, are going to be public and may be subject to discovery in the event of uh, any litigation. So blue sheets are automatic uh, from your attendance. Uh, note taker, we have a note taker. Uh, can we have someone to help uh, with Java? On the other end, right, to be honest, it's Eric here. Uh, there is no real need anymore to use Java, so no need for a Java scribe. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Eric. So, um, moving on to the to the agenda bashing. Uh, so we are going to start with the usual uh, document status updates from us. Um, I'm then going to move on to give you uh, an update about the Martinez uh, both that took place at the last IETF and the side meeting that uh, took place yesterday about MAC address randomization. Then we have uh, Tommy uh, talking about uh, per application networking, uh, Pascal on chic or PPP, Shooting on um, APN, and then uh, we have Ihao on uh, challenging scenarios and problems in internet, in internet addressing. Any questions or points about the agenda? Okay, so hearing none. Uh, for the quick update, uh, so a reminder, we had the, the provision domain names and data uh, published as RFC 8801. We also had the IP fragmentation uh, considered fragile, uh, published as RFC 8900. And the GUI, uh, which is version 9, it's, uh, it's on ID evaluation. So still uh, going through the, through the process of uh, publication. Uh, the other news that we have is on the SOX protocol version 6 from, from uh, Vlad. So that uh, draft was moved to the independent stream. Moving on, uh, just a quick update on the, on the Madinas uh, status. 
Madinas is uh, a booth that took place at the ITF uh, 109 to look at uh, MAC address randomization, especially uh, around Wi-Fi and the effects on uh, networking protocols and infrastructure. So basically it's how to address the fact that uh, new standards and operating systems are now uh, randomizing MAC address. Uh, and this is because of uh, privacy issues that were held before uh, regarding the long lasting identifiers uh, embedded in, especially in IEEE A2 protocols, uh, notably the MAC address that could be used to track um, individuals unwillingly. And then uh, there had been uh, new changes to standards and operating systems where this address is changed. Now, because this address was uh, used as an identifier by upper layer protocols, uh, we are looking at what uh, could be the potential disruptions on these protocols and uh, if there are existing solutions, uh, if this solution should be recommended, or if uh, actually we need to work on some uh, new solutions. Uh, of course, this in the scope of IETF, uh, meaning protocols like um, DHCP and so on. So there's a couple of drafts. Uh, one was discussed uh, heavily yesterday on the problem statement, uh, draft uh, Henry Medinas. Uh, then there is also the macro randomization background uh, by myself and, and a couple of co-authors, Amelia and Carlos, that um, tried to explain what is the background of this uh, effort. And uh, in the upcoming uh, meetings, we are expecting to have uh, first uh, an interim meeting uh, in mid-April. And then uh, we are uh, foreseeing probably having another buff at IETF uh, uh, 111. So if you are interested in this topic, uh, we encourage you to join the mailing list and you have the link there. Okay, so that's it uh, for uh, updates. Next, we have uh, Tommy. Would you All like right, to hello. share your screen? Um, do, do you have the slides on your side? Uh, yes, give me one second. If you don't mind. One second. I'm having an issue here with uh, permission, so let me try again. Probably because I stopped. Uh, it's not letting me share again. I don't know if it's because I stopped. So give me one more sec. Does it work? Yes, you can see it now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing this. All right. So I'm going to be sharing a uh, update on a draft that we actually wrote uh, last November. We didn't have time to talk about it then. Um, we haven't done an update because I think it's the content we believed was still relevant, but we'd like to have a discussion here and get people's input and see. Um, if it's something that we believe that this group should work on. And so this is a draft about uh, perhaps networking considerations. And uh, I have co-authored this with Lorenzo from Google. Um, I'm from the Apple side. And next slide, please. So the motivation behind this is we've seen a lot of conversations um, in IETF, in proposals, as well as conversations outside of IETF, um, 
in 3GBP and other venues that are talking a lot about having application-based networking, application-aware networking, having uh, you know, a tighter integration between the network and applications. And this has a big impact on the architecture. It has a big impact on how we think of data going through um, the internet layer. And what we felt was missing was a uh, IETF kind of statement and position around the problem space, the way, right way to approach it when you're talking about putting this type of information in IP or near it. Um, and so this draft is more of a requirements problem space description draft is meant purely to be informational um, to help kind of set the stage and define the principles that um, we as a community would believe are the right ones to approach this problem. And so we tried to write down what we thought were the principles that we were coming from as client OS implementers, um, but we'd be very happy to have that scope and um, authorship be broadened. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to walk through essentially the different sections of the draft and what we're saying in it if you haven't read it. Um, so generally, first we start out with the use cases. And there are you know, many legitimate use cases in which there is a desire to have more deep integration between an application and a network. Um, and you particularly see this when you have mobile devices that are connected to different networks or have different capabilities for access. Some of the use cases are you, know, you can have a very dedicated uh, network access that's only meant for specific things. Um, this is very, very common in the cellular world in which um, I have a specific APN that's only usable for a specific application that's doing messaging, voice calls, something like that. But you also see this when you're on a walled garden network. Um, and you can only access the media on the airplane through this particular link. And you want to be able to have a strong binding between your media player and that particular access. And this is very much related to the work that we already did in into area around uh, provisioning domains. You can also have enterprise networks that have different types of routing. You have cases where maybe you have uh, voice or video calls wanting to have a special channel so they are treated differently than um, generic download traffic. Services often are zero rated on specific networks, and that requires some type of identification. And then you can also have cases of local breakout where you need to route traffic differently just to get to local resources. Next slide. So those were um, kind of, that's the positive side of what, you know, what are people trying to achieve, but there are a lot of concerns about how we approach this problem and how we achieve that. And today, generally, we've kind of just fallen into um, mechanisms that were convenient um, because there was a lot of information that was sent um, purely unencrypted, available to anyone. So you could do a lot of um, interception or deep packet inspection. So this can happen by intercepting DNS. This can happen by um, looking at flows and examining the TLS server name indicator on flows. And generally, while we recognize that this is something that has evolved organically, there are a lot of problems with deep packet inspection as your main mechanism for routing traffic. It's complex. There are um, a lot of policy and privacy concerns. And as we see more and more encryption, which is very much a good thing, this is becoming more problematic and less effective. And I think we can argue that that's what is causing a lot of the new proposals of how do we put more and more information that is less protected. Um, so and this has led to a lot of these uh, new proposals that we are listing here. And so we're trying to, in this draft, explore the implications and suggest uh, ways of mitigating the problem. Next slide, please. So you know, some of the problems, of course, are around open internet or net neutrality, um, how traffic is um, being treated. If this is being done without any consent of the user of the application, that can lead to a lot of problems. 
Um, and there's essentially you know, two general types of mitigations you could have to this. You could more generalize the markings you have for your traffic to say that you know, we need to focus on traffic classes and traffic categories more than specific application identifiers. And the other alternative is to put more trust into the network, um, that if you're not going to just give generic markings, you're going to need to have user opt-in, application opt-in, and network opt-in, and have some form of trust that um, proves that this is not being done without the um, permission of everyone involved. Next slide, please. And of course, there are many, many privacy implications. <clears throat> if you are blindly putting application information onto the network, um, there are many statements that ITF has already made around um, saying that your network protocols should not be exposing information unnecessarily to the network, um, it's particularly when it's privacy sensitive. The applications and the patterns of usage that users have is critically important to keep private like that is very much their data and can be abused and misused in many many ways so we need to be very serious about that and it's good to note here that your identity can be exposed even if you aren't explicitly saying i'm using this network if we uh, sorry i'm using this application because if there is a policy that the client learns about to say that oh yes this provisioning domain this network slice this you know path is only meant to be used by the Netflix app, and you see packets on that, you know for sure that that user is using that application. So, um, you know, it's, it's not quite good enough to do that either. And again, we kind of realize that the mitigations that were obvious here are either saying we need to generalize the information we're giving to make it more like a traffic class or a category, or we need to have more trust and consent all the way through the path. Next slide, please. We talk a little bit in the draft about suggestions for how you define categories to generalize traffic. Um, you know, traditionally we already have markings like DCP bits, and that can essentially just give different buckets of traffic class. It is possible um, to say that you know we could have more specific categories for categories of different types of applications. We could say maybe you know this is a interactive game as opposed to an interactive video call and there could be a discussion around where the line is for that being um okay from a neutrality and privacy standpoint to share but we believe that that is where the discussion needs to happen and then we also make a note that and this is particularly important for the client os is um when we're talking about architectures that could give information to the network we need to make sure that we have bounds on the types of APIs that the internet and transport layer are offering up around how you signal this information. Um, we don't want to see a world in which applications um, identifiers are automatically scooped up by an OS and being marked on behalf of applications without their intent. We need to have uh, some sort of very explicit opt-in and a way that if we are going to go down the road of having more trust between the network and the application and the user, we need to bootstrap that trust by allowing um, applications to select or indicate what type of treatment they allow for their network traffic. Um, this could tie into how applications are aware of different provisioning domains, um, but that's an area that could be explored more. Next slide, please. So that's a summary of the document. It's pretty short. Um, I, I think it's something that we would like to plant as a seed and see how we can expand upon and get more input from people. Um, we believe that there is a need in this conversation for a document about principles and requirements so that we can point to something when we're having discussions within the IETF as well as in other SDOs. Um, if we as a community think that the internet layer should be used in a certain way, let's explain that. So I'd like to hear from people if there's interest in exploring this problem here, and if we think that int area is an appropriate place for this. Um, we thought so given some of the previous work we'd done here, 
But if there's a better venue, we'd love to hear that as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Tommy. So, Dave? Two other presentations this week on this topic, but they're in the solution space. And so since you're talking about the problems and considerations, that's why I think this is the best of those three talks. The other ones were in uh, dispatch, which is app area. And the, uh, another one was in the security area in SOG. Okay. And so this gets to your question about what's the appropriate place? Because I think the apps area is very much interested in this topic. The security area is very much interested in this topic. And the internet area is very much interested in this topic. Um, I think the style of stuff that you're talking about in this draft right now is most appropriate for the internet area. And so I might think that internet area is the best place for it, meaning I agree with you on that one. Uh, but it's going to want a review and input from both apps and security, given that they, are discuss it, they discussed it even this week, right? Um, yes. uh, so that's my main comment on that one. So yes, I'm absolutely interested in it. And I, uh, I know this is a draft zero zero. I would be happy to help with this one. Um, I, if you want additional help with this one, I see you got authors from uh, the other two OS vendors. If you want somebody from Microsoft, I'd be happy to help contribute. So thanks for the offer. Yeah, we'd love to have help. Thank you, Spencer. Tommy, thank you a lot for this for this talk. Um, uh, I would say definitely yes, interested in uh, doing a document on this, and uh, I'm personally interested in exploration here. Uh, the one question I would ask you uh, is whether you think this is uh, engineering or research, and I'm not asking you whether people are doing engineering now. I know the answer to that. I'm asking whether you think it's really engineering or research. Uh, discussions we've had in the PanRG uh, research group over the past several years have uh, really talked about uh, end host trusting network uh, nodes and network nodes trusting host as two of the really intractable problems that people have been trying to deal with. Um, we we, you know, PanRG isn't where the expertise is on that, but we know a lot of, you know, we know a lot of places of things are blown up. So I would, I would, uh, I would encourage you strongly to do it someplace. Uh, I would, I would uh, be interested in helping uh, if that's helpful. And, um, but like I said, I would, I would, I would like for people to be really crisp on whether, uh, this is ready for engineering yet, uh, or whether it's really research. Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing that up. Um, just you, you can say that just to respond. Um, I, I personally think that there are actually, uh, you know, three different legs of what we can say in this area. I think we should say all of them. And I think there's a leg of this that probably belongs in IAB. That's an architectural statement about how these things all work together. I think there is a leg that is research still, which is the solution space. How do we actually build trust between all of these nodes? Absolutely still research. What we're trying to do here, and you know, I'd love to help to make sure we do it better, is to have an, an engineering scope statement about what we are doing today, to not to not to go into the possible solution space of the future, but to say, these are the tools we have. These are the ways that we think it is bad to use the tools because there are conversations that are going on actively in you know, how do we deal with 5G slices and stuff that are engineering decisions today in how we expose app APIs to applications to deal with slicing that we need to make decisions about at an engineering level you know, very soon. So I think there is an aspect of it, but we need to limit ourselves, and that defines the scope of this document, I believe. I, th I think, and if that turned into a, a anything like a gap analysis uh, for tool additional tools that we would need, I yes. think that would be absolutely fabulous. Uh, and I would hope I would hope a, a future ISG would be excited about doing a buff on that. Enjoy your day. Yeah. Perhaps the like an IAB document or an architectural document can point out some of the gaps in where the IETF needs to do more work. Excellent. Thank you. 
Thanks. So we're stopping the queue now. Uh, so if you are brief, this is an interesting topic. So I want to give a chance to everyone. So please uh, be mindful of time uh, and try to be to the point. Shuping. So here, I would like to thank you and uh, for your suggestions on the APN, especially you referred to it. And you gave us some suggestions on how to mitigate the privacy issue. And you know that uh, uh, the privacy has been the, we could say it's the top challenges that people has been um, uh, uh, asked on APN work. And uh, so your suggestion is to categorize the traffic and uh, making them as a group. But actually it has been like this. and. It, we just uh, we didn't explicitly express that in the draft, and uh, so thank you for your draft. And uh, we have further refined our proposal. And uh, but our focus is more on the network layer, and uh, so we would like to uh, to provide the network services within the operator's control network uh, domain. So I will present it later, and uh, mm -hmm. we would like to have your review and uh, comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and just to clarify, um, I think some of the conversation around APN and other things has spurred on the, the need for a statement here. But I, I, we do not view this as specifically a critique on that, but actually a critique of the overall space and uh, trying to have a piece of work that can be used by APN documents, by other documents, as something to point to and build upon um, principles to use. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, Mivia? Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I do agree very much to the point that we should not add any additional um, personal identifiers to any of the protocols. <laughs> That's really important. Um, and you add some some privacy discussion to it. But I'm not fully agreeing actually to the rest of the accommodation given in this um, document, which is basically, as I understand it, use application identifiers instead. Um, uh, Gary made my point on the chat already a little bit, and uh, I think like whatever information you signal is is very specific to what you want to achieve in the network, and it has to be tailored exactly to that point. So there's not like one set of information that you would just like broadcast in the network, and then you hope something nice is happening. I think this is a pair case, pair mechanism. Uh, case basis to figure out what is the right information, what's the minimal set of information to not reveal anything it, that you don't want to reveal, but also to make sure that you get exactly out of it what you want to get, right? Because mm -hmm. the risk if you're providing like more information than needed is that the network actually does something with it that you didn't expect. So mm -hmm. um, uh, these are all um, good points, which I don't think is like exactly what you're saying in the document. And especially, there has been a lot of research work about trying to use application identifiers and make somehow use of them. And it's really hard uh, because applications are not really classifiable. There's like every day a new application, and they have all slightly different requirements. Um, yep. So I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like um, there might be a document we can write. I'm not sure if it's this document, and I'm not sure where it belongs because I'm not sure what should be in there. Okay, I think I would appreciate then, you know, we could have review or the specific recommendations can certainly be changed and evolved to be kind of what this group and what the community wants. Um, but I, I think this is a place where we can start iterating on that from and you can point out, you know, what, what are the things that are, uh, can be refined in the recommendations. So I'm a little bit worried that it's much, It's maybe it's a good statement to say what you should not do. Maybe that's important as well, but yeah, we'll try right. to, to actually give a recommendation about what you should be doing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Warren. Thanks. Um, while I'm asking my question, can we go back to slide five? <clears throat> so Dave might have already said this in the chat, but I think something that would be really important is to first understand what bits we can't currently do. I mean, a lot of this feels like DSCP or quality of service is stuff that we invented a long time back and was yep. never deployed. It seems like doing the same thing again might not end well. 
or maybe this just ends up being, you should use provisioning domains and quality of service done. Um, my concern with this slide is the last bullet of maybe mitigate if users are aware of special treatment. The concern is if the user only has one option, which is yes and yes, um, mm -hmm. making them aware doesn't really help. Right? If the user ends up in a situation where they don't actually have a choice, they're just aware that whatever they're doing is subject to this. It doesn't help them at all. And I think that's my soapbox rant. That's good. That's a very good point. Uh, I Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, I think the first thing I'd like to see is, is real discussions on the mailing list. Um, uh, after you, you posted this to Indaria, I sent um, a range of, of, of thoughts about this. haven't seen any reply from you or other authors, and uh, neither any other, um, you know, I think, good discussion. So hopefully we can have the discussion, because certainly I think that topic is very important. And uh, quite frankly, you know, I'm beside the pointers that I was uh, providing in that email of, of prior work that I did in that respect, and the responses I I got back, you know, a couple of years back in in area, which would be interesting, I think, to re reinvestigate with respect to the you know opinions of the organization. Um, a lot of the work where we've we've seen come from the network uh, equipment vendor industry is not necessarily only the open internet, right? But a lot of these things uh, are a lot more required and, and requested for um, by, you know, what uh, since 8799 we're calling uh, limit domain networks, right? So mm -hmm. and these limited domain networks can go as far as a home network uh, connecting to a service provider where the customer in the home network has an explicit contract. There is all type of, you know, necessarily security, right? We've done protocols like PCP and others uh, for signaling, right? So there is a lot more interaction we can get if we take out the worst possible case of an internet path with transit service providers that have no business relationship and might snoop on the traffic and so on, right? So I think this this classification of the deployment models, I think, would be very welcome as, as a first addition to consider for that. Because maybe you're not interested in that, but maybe the example I was just giving uh, mm -hmm. raises the interest again, because a limited domain is, I think, 90% of what we're seeing on the internet today. Thank you. Uh, Shenmin? Hello, Tommy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I I I uh, agree uh, uh, very much in the uh, in the proposal about that the uh, when the in order to mitigate the privacy issue uh, should not uh, to uh, uh, indicate the individual applications uh, in the uh, to the network. Uh, I think that uh, this also has another issue because uh, you, we know that the individual applications develop very fast you we de uh, depend on the depend on the individual application so that's the network has to adapt it to this individual application this is also very difficult and also in the practice we also think that the 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 individual application is very hard for the network to process yeah, so that's the first uh, point. The second point, uh, I maybe this the mentioned, uh, also mentioned by the uh, Tollis. You, you know that uh, when do the AP work, we also investigate the scenario because you know that some of this uh, limited domain, you know mm -hmm. that for some of this enterprise network or, or they are carrier IP network. So the end, end, uh, end to end controlled by the enterprise or the or, uh, operators. So that they hope to can identify their applications, uh, and that's to find granularity, so that they can easily track to their service. So that's in my point. That is a, a little different from this the internet process. Mm -hmm. So I want because here we want to set up this the general the principles, but I think not only. 
uh, uh, this is to get this the response from the uh, people in the internet and also maybe also some of this the limited domain uh, the requirement should also be taken into account that's maybe yeah, that's helpful yeah yeah that's a good point um and just to respond briefly to the overall um, limited domain usage, I, I do think that does fit in well, and I think there is still a need, uh, and there's a gap there um, that we are trying to highlight by talking about how you know the applications interact with the network, how they select it. Um, oftentimes today, a device is not necessarily aware of when it's on a limited domain or open internet, what it should trust or not, and um, kind of defining those guardrails around what would it be appropriate for an application to do to indicate um, via an API what it wants to select is something that needs to be done still. All right, I think we've spent a lot of time on this. So we can, we'll see yes, you thank you very much. Uh, so we definitely have a vivid interest. And in, uh, then uh, to answer the question, uh, we are going to take it on uh, Authors, uh, chairs, and AD to see the, the right venue and uh, potentially go for an adoption call. But thank you very much for the presentation. So I'm going to put up sl uh, Pascal's slides. Uh, or, or Pascal, would you like to present yourself? Well, Juan Carlos, um, it's easier that you do, but if you want me to, I can. Okay, give me one second. It's a little slow. Okay. Okay, so we don't have much time. I guess we are a bit late. So I'll skip through quite rapidly. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a quick reminder. Oh, no, not this one. First slide first, please. Next yeah. one. Tringingly, it's been modified. But can you go back to the previous slide? Okay, so what's this work about? So LP1 Working Group has defined a new compression mechanism, which is really, really efficient and uh, completely stateful, by the way, to get that level of efficiency. It was defined for uh, LP1 types of networks, so that's LoRa, Sigfox, and, and BIoT, for instance, types of network. As it goes, um, this compression could be useful in other domains and for instance, if you uh, want to, to use TDM and time slotting in any type of network and for which you need a fixed size or maximum size, it's very useful to compress uh, protocols. I'm thinking of protocols like Goose, for instance, in uh, electric grid, um, which is really um, time sensitive, but at the same time, wasting a lot of bandwidth. So uh, it could be cool to use something like Shake to compress it. So the idea here is to define Shake over PPP, because if you define something over PPP, then um, because you have PPPoE, you can use it also over Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So at the end of the day, Shake over PPP is the way to have Shake pretty much everywhere. Also, it's kind of classical for PPP to have compression mechanisms. Uh, CRFC 5172, there are already two compression mechanisms, sleep from capture of sun. So now we, we are just defining yet another one. So it's, it's not like something completely revolutionary, but it could be dramatically useful. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is basically a packet format of the compression. So for those who have looked at, at PPP and PPPoE, this is exactly the, the shape of a PPPoE um, frame. And starting after the OF57, which signals IPv6, you can see uh, the chic rule. So that's really the matching table in the stateful compression. And then the compression residue, that is everything that could that had to be placed online. And if you don't use fragmentation, the, this draft adds the capability uh, to, to add some uh, original payload that would not be compressed. For instance, in my example of Goose, uh, you could say, hey, all those long names can be compressed, and then the Goose data itself can be uh, left in, in line. Next slide. Next slide, one class, please. Okay. So status of the draft very stable or didn't change since last IETF. Uh, we discussed it uh, several times uh, at LP1 because it has a lot to do with, with LP1. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the, the, the LP1 chairs and, and our AD, Eric, we all decided it's mostly PPP, mostly not check. So that's why it's, it's presented here at Interior. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here is the, the generic flow that you will see for, for this draft, but also for PPP uh, OE in general. So, so what happens, and which is kind of new to the LP1 architecture, is instead of having a sensor device, which is this low power battery operated device, and a gateway, which is this uh, service provider side uh, translator, de uh, decompressor, etc. We are acting in a peer-to-peer -peer mode where a one switch or router is doing the compression and a peer switch or router is doing the decompression. And you've got this PPP session between those two, possibly over Ethernet. So this changes the model because now you don't have a, a low power side and a, like a client on a server, it's really peer-to-peer. -peer. So the cool thing with that is they can actually go and fetch the exact same role set at the exact same place. This is why after we do the discovery in the LCP configuration, which is like the classical PPP, um, you have in the IPCP, IPv6 CP configuration request um, with option two, um, we have this request of, which is the new value. Um, we are saying check as the compression protocol, but we're also giving a URL as the associated data and that URL is the place where both sides can get the exact same set of rules, which guarantees us to, to have the right compression decompression. So both sides go and get the, the rules and, and get it, and now we can uh, effectively do the compression. So that's the flow, very simple. It really depends, next slide please. It really depends on the um, Chic uh, Yang model, which is being defined right now, the LP1 protocol. So where are we? Draft is stable, uh, it's been discussed several times at LP1. If there are LP1 consideration, I'm pretty sure we, we'll do a round after the last call in, in Interia, we'll do a round at LP1 to just validate that everything is correct on the LP1 side. But pretty much stable, uh, not very complicated. It's just yet another compression protocol for PPP, which already had two. So um, the classical questions, I mean, is there anybody who wants from the interior side to help me on the PPP side, just to make sure everything is PPP correct? Um, do we need more text or is it already quite complete? Like, do people want an applicability statement? Like explain why we need it. Usually we don't do too much of that in a Star Trek document, but if people think it's necessary, we can write it. And is there anything beyond what is in this draft, which could be added again, uh, open to suggestion? And also open to the chairs proposing uh, adoption because <laughs> now the draft is stable. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. So uh, we have time for uh, one question if there is. Otherwise, I like those people to pick it on the list. Sorry. Could you hear? I could not hear you well, Juan Carlos. I'm sorry, the voice went blue. Uh, okay, let me try again. Uh, I was saying if we could take one question uh, to make it fast, and otherwise I would encourage uh, people to ask, uh, ask to answer. Sorry, Pascal's questions on the list. Okay, thanks, Pascal. I might have some 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 feedback, but uh, I, I will make sure that I provide it after the meeting. Yeah. And about adoption, Juan Carlos, are we ready now? Because the, we didn't move for, for like six six months. Uh, would, would you like to? Uh, well, we I'd like to get the sense a, of the group uh, if it fits there and if we can adapt it. I mean, it's not a work group last okay. call, right? It's an adoption. Okay. Uh, let me start by uh, asking uh, on the ballot how many people have read uh, this draft? And I'm starting the poll now. Can you see it in yellow? Yes, okay. Click on the poll in the upper right to see it. Right. So I see people starting to, to vote. Um, So one couple of more seconds. Uh, please raise your hand if you have read it, uh, and do not raise your hand if you have not read it. Uh, but uh, the more uh, information we have, the better. OK. 
Okay, so we have about uh, six people that have uh, read it. So please uh, take a look. I think that the, the, the intention would be to adopt this, this draft. Uh, and uh, for that, we need to have more eyes and more feedback. So uh, as Pascal said, it's quite stable and it's quite simple, but uh, we do need a couple of more eyes to make sure that uh, we're going on the right uh, path. Okay, so thank you, Pascal. So now, shipping, uh, you have less time, unfortunately, than uh, previously planned. I'm going to show your slides now. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Hi, thank you, Chair. And uh, this is Xu Ping. I'm going to present APN application aware networking. Next, please. <clears throat> so, first, about the purpose of this presentation in here. And uh, we were actually suggested by the IESG and uh, to present in the inter area. And uh, we have this. We have seen discussions on APN in this working group, and as uh, Tommy just uh, presented, and uh, we also have the mailing the APN mailing list, and uh, we have uh, very active discussions there. So uh, we would like to collect more feedback uh, via the discussions here, and to further address the concerns raised by the ESG. Thank you. Uh, next the slides, please. So basically, I will follow what, why, and how this logic logic to organize this uh, presentation. So first, what is APN? Uh, APN is about uh, on the network layer, and we would like to enable the implementation of the fine-grained user group, application group, and the service level requirements guarantee. And uh, in order to do this, we will focus on developing a framework and a set of uh, mechanisms to derive, convey, and use and this uh, we call the APN attribute. And this information will be encapsulated in the data packet, and it will be treated as an object in the network. And to this object, the network operator could apply policies in various nodes or service functions along the path. So what is very important is APN works within a limited operator's domain. And generally, this domain is defined as a service provider's limited domain within this domain. And the, the operator could uh, apply their technologies and to provide services. And uh, we can see from this uh, simple diagram, diagram and the APN attribute, attribute is tagged and removed at the at the edge of the limited domain. That means once this package leaves this domain and the attribute will be removed and it won't impact the rest of the internet. So next slide, please. So what is equally important is what APN is not. So APN is not about identifying the particular application, all the users to the network or within the network. Actually, the network doesn't need to know what, who you are and what you are doing, which application is actually sending the traffic. And uh, to have this uh, information, it will break the privacy and we are aware of that. So it's all about policy enforcement in the network. The network doesn't need to know those information. And it only needs the like uh, opaque value or a bit string to do the policy enforcement on the various places. I mean, the to be specific, is on the network nodes or service functions. So APN is not PANRG. And uh, we want to make the network aware of the application's uh, requirements. It's not the other way around. And APN is not smart plus, so which carries the information um, 
on the transport layer, we use the network layer. And APN is not network tokens, which tags the tokens from the host, but APN tags the attribute at the network edge device. And uh, at the end, it is also the conclusion we uh, derived from the SAD meeting at IETF 108. That is to convey the information at different layers, at different technologies, and APN uses the network layer. Next slide, please. Yeah, we will need to transition to the next presentation in about four minutes, so just a heads up. So um, now why APN? Here we use a very concrete use case, and it's sd one And in the case of sd one the network operators can provide the SLA guaranteed one lines to enable the enterprise to access to the clouds. But when we map the one line into the network operator's um, network, and then usually you will find multiple network paths with different um, SRA guarantees. So in the MEF70, we, there are already a list of uh, match items. They are published to add the network edge nodes, and which could be used to steer the traffic into the lines. And, but still, there is the need to communicate the user applications requirements to the network to match to the, capability, the capabilities of the one line. So that is once the traffic goes into the operator's network, there is a need to apply the various policies in the different nodes or service functions along the path. For example, at the head end, we need to steer into the corresponding path to, to satisfy the SRA at the midpoint and we need to collect the performance measurement and also to do the visualization. And as the service function, and we need to execute the, the policies. So next slide, please. So that is impossible to do it with the current existing mechanisms. Probably we could stack the various policies in a list of TRV in the head of uh, uh, each packet, but you can imagine the big challenge is going to be imposed on the hardware processing. And also, um, when people do the policy-based routing along the network path, normally the ACR well five tuples is used, but sometimes it's very complicated to resolve. For example, with the tunnel encapsulation, it's very hard to have these uh, five tuples because the transport layer is pushed very down and with the IPsec, it's impossible to, to obtain the transport layer. And also with IPv6 data plane, with those in, in extension headers and uh, to be added, and the, the transport layer is pushed very further down. It's impossible to get them. Next slide, please. Yeah. Two more minutes. OK. So how? And uh, here we recommend to uh, acquire or construct this attribute at the network edge and encapsulate it in the packet and to treat it as an object and then provide services to it. And uh, so that will bring a lot of benefits. For example, now you only need to uh, check one field in the IP layer instead of resolve the five tuples in different uh, places in the um, packet header. And uh, also, uh, it will enable very flexible policy enforcement. And further, so for the SFC, when we do the service function um, uh, policy enforcement, now you only need to check this uh, one field. It will also enable fine granularity performance measurement and the visual visualization. And it's not only for the overlay, but underlay, but also works for the overlay. Next, please. And here we have did some, uh, we have done some gap analysis and uh, quickly go through. DSCP is not big enough and flow label and entropy is for the ECMP and service ID is only carried in the NSH, but the APN, the attribute is decoupled from data plane. IOM flow ID has a, uh, the dedicated purpose and the bending seed is bound to the SR and flow spec label is bound to the MPRs, but APN is decoupled from the data plane. 
So you can see all the existing solutions are specific to a particular scenario, our data plane. It's not the same as APN, and uh, it's uh, un unable to achieve the same impacts. So generally, so APN aims to define a generalized attribute used for the service for uh, provisioning, and that could be carried in the various uh, data plane. Next slide, please. So I will leave it here, and uh, we have presented in the dispatch and the art, and uh, here are some frequently asked questions. Um, we, so here I won't go into details, and uh, you can check it from the uh, slides. So, but, but basically people have been frequently asked the similar questions. Um, next, please. Here are some uh, uh, questions we would like to discuss with you further about the security issues and uh, whether when we do it in the uh, limited network domain, whether there are still uh, security issues and about privacy, I think we find some ways to mitigate them and we use opaque value. And um, so what is most important is the network. When we do the policy enforcement, we don't need to know um, what uh, the traffic, uh, so who the user is and uh, what application is. The network only needs to know the um, bit string and to do the policy enforcement. So, so uh, next, uh, we're, we're, we're out of mm -hmm. time now. So I'm sorry mm -hmm. for, for the people in the queue, but I think to be fair for the last presenter, maybe we can take the, the questions on the list if you don't mind. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Actually, my comment was just this is the second virtual ITF in a row where you only allocate an hour for India. Could we please? Uh, could we get a little bit more o overall for these discussions? That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll take that into account. Yeah. Hey, hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the time. Um, Today's topic is about the challenges, scenarios, and problems in the internet addressing. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Thanks. Uh, this topic is about internet addressing. So, uh, sorry. Another uh, internet addressing is all about the IP address. So we know IP, IP address is a carrier for the forwarder to know how to uh, routing a packet. And on the other hand, uh, we know there's a lot of limited domain networks and uh, they are behind the internet. For this limited domain networks, the requirements, uh, no behaviors, uh, especially for how nodes forward a packet and uh, semantics are totally different uh, from the internet address. Uh, so if we want to use I internet protocol in this limited domain networks, uh, we have to develop some of the additional adaptation technology to make that happen. Uh, next, please. Uh, so in this draft, we want to focus on the question in, in the middle. Uh, that is, should limited domains purely rely on IP address and therefore deal with the complexity of translating any semantics mismatch themselves? or should flexibility for supporting those limited domains be a key focus for involved internet addressing? And uh, generally, this is asked for a discussion uh, on the emerging needs for involving internet addressing on the current objectives and paradise, uh, especially for the uh, uh, addressing for IPv6, and we are not gonna to propose or uh, promote a solution for these problems. Uh, next, please. Uh, what we have done in this draft is that we first provide some of the scenarios. Uh, in these scenarios, we found if we're using IP uh, internet protocol in these scenarios, uh, we found some challenges and problems. In order to still make the internet pro protocol cover this scenario, limited domain networks, uh, we have to develop some like some protocols like six low pen, and uh, there are new adaptation technologies must be developed to include the internet protocol to cover this limited domain. And uh, because these solutions are within the paradigm of the internet addressing, especially for IPv6, uh, we figure that uh, there are issues and the problems 
we are facing if we're still using solutions uh, within the current uh, paradigm of internet addressing. Uh, so we uh, have uh, we we summarize a lot of issues in for using these solutions, and this is what we done in the first draft. Uh, we plan to do in the pre, uh, in the update version or in the se uh, separate uh, document is that uh, we want to find uh, if we want to still involve the internet addressing, what's the challenges we have, and uh, what's the gap we have if we want to do that. Uh, so this leads to the two directions. The first direction is that we confirm there are a lot of uh, problems or issues if we insist the uh, if we insist the current uh, addressing paradise. And uh, so the issues uh, will stay uh, stay here, and we are still facing this issue if we insist the current internet addressing. Uh, this is the first direction. The second direction is that uh, we think uh, these problems need to be solved, and uh, we need to have more discussion about how we involve the uh, internet addressing. So uh, this is a draft call for uh, a broader discussion for this direction. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so we're at the end of the hour. So if you can uh, be quick and wrap up, it would be appreciated. OK, uh, I think uh, the next slide is for the end of the, uh, the topic. Uh, so the question for here is that we want to talk about uh, if there's uh, really a need for emerging, uh, emerging needs for if we want to involve the internet addressing that is beyond, the, especially beyond the IPv6 uh, internet addressing. Uh, and we are open to uh, people who would like to contribute to push this uh, work forward. And uh, I, I'd like to end it up here and uh, open for questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, we can take one question. Otherwise, uh, we encourage people to, to get on the list. OK. All right, so uh, let's take the discussion then to, to the list. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your participation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, online uh, soon in the future. So take care. Be safe. Ciao.